Can everyone hear me in the back? As a West, I'm used to being told, told to be quiet rather than speak up, but for some reason you can't hear me, just raise your hand. As Brother David mentioned, my topic of this time to me is the famous for the Word of God. And if you'd like, you can go ahead and open your Bibles to Amos chapter 8. We'll be spending some time there. That's where the lesson text comes from. We'll also be spending some time in other passages or other chapters in Amos. So Merriam-Webster defines the word famine as an extreme, extreme scarcity of food or a great shortage. We really don't have to deal with that much here in America. We have an abundance of pretty much everything. But back in, especially this time and in third world countries, when they rely on the land, they rely on their crops. When something happened to their crops, especially weather, drought, they had a scarcity of food. And they had to wonder where the next meal was going to come from. But I think the second definition, given that word, a great shortage, will better fit the lesson today. In about 750 BC, an obscure farmer and shepherd was called by God to be a prophet. This man's name was Amos. God called Amos to warn the northern kingdom of Israel of God's coming judgment if they did not repent. Sadly, the nation did not heed the prophet's message to repent. As a consequence, they went into Assyrian captivity. Part of Amos' prophecy was fulfilled concerning an unusual famine that would become upon the people. This was a famine of the word of God. If you look at Amos chapter 8, starting in verse 11, it reads, Behold, the days come, said the Lord, that I will send a famine in the land, not a famine of bread, nor a thirst of water, but a hearing of the words of the Lord. And they shall wander from sea to sea, and from the north even to the east. And they shall run to and fro, and seek the word of the Lord, and shall not find it. And that day they, and that day the fair virgins and young men shall faint for thirst. They that swear by the sin of Samaria, and say, O God, O Dan, liveth. And the manner of Beersheba liveth. Even they shall fall, and never rise up again. Today, there is also a famine of the Word of God. And sadly, you see this with talking to really anyone in the world, even if they claim to be religious. And I think one of the main places I see it when talking to people is, you know, you can see it when you say, talk about judgment. And they'll say, oh, the Bible says judge not. But when you really try talking to them, they don't know where it's found. They don't know the context of it. They don't know that verse is actually talking about proper judgment and that we are to judge. People just don't know the word of God. And they take what other people hear and they just repeat it without actually searching for themselves. As many people know, I own a couple of reptiles. One of those is a snake. And when I first got my snake, I was telling my coworker about it. He was kind of surprised. He said, aren't you a Christian? Y'all can have snakes. Because he compared it to the devil. So I had to spend a little time explaining to him about that. But he was just ignorant of the word. There is a famine of the word of God. In some ways, it's different than the time of Amos. However, in other ways, it's similar. And it has produced and continues to produce similar results. So we'll compare the present day famine with the one foretold by Amos concerning the northern kingdom of Israel. The present day famine. How is it different? Sorry, I got about nine pages up to circle through. The present day famine for the word of God was not sent by God. On the contrary, uh, it is evident that God has provided peace and not a famine for us. We enjoy an abundance of Bibles, especially here in America. I'm sure everyone has one of these. You can easily go to the App Store, download a Bible for free, and have it at your fingertips, because I know everyone has their phone at their fingertips. You can go to Dollar Tree, pick up a New Testament for a dollar. We have access to Bibles in America. Unfortunately, most people will never open them when they live here. In the history of mankind, never has the world enjoyed 
such free access to God's word. Unlike the famine of Amos' time, today's famine of the word of God is self-imposed. Despite such access to the Bible, the following diary of a Bible illustrates what is so often true. January, and this is coming from the Bible's perspective, a busy time for me. Most of the family decided to read me through the year. They kept me busy for the first few weeks. Now I am forgotten. February, my owner used me a few minutes last week. He had an argument and was checking references. March, Grandpa visited me. He kept me on his lap for an hour, reading 1 Corinthians 13. April, I had a busy day. My owner was appointed leader of something and used me. I got to go to church for the first time this year, Easter Sunday. May, I have a few grass stages, stains on my page. Had some early spring flowers pressed in them. June, I look like a scrapbook. They have stuffed me full of clippings. One of the girls got married. July, they put me in a suitcase today. I guess we're off on a vacation. I wish I could stay home, as I'll have to stay in this thing for a month. August, still in the suitcase. September, back home again and in my old place. I have a lots of company. Two true stories and four funny books on top of me. I wish I could read them as much as, I wish I was read as much as they are. October, they used me a little today. One of them is sick. Right now, I'm all shined up in the center of the table. I think the preacher is coming. November, back in my old place. December, they're getting ready for Christmas. I'll be covered with wrapping papers and packages. The answer as to why this present day famine for the word of God exists may be found in comparing the famine to the one foretold by Jesus. <coughs> How is it similar? The present day famine is a result of the similar causes. In Amos' day, this was a cause of pride, which God hated. If you want to turn to Amos chapter 6, we'll start in verse 1. It says, Woe to them that are at ease at Zion and trust in the mountain of Samaria, which are named chief of the nations, to whom the house of Israel came. Pass ye Kalna and see, and from thence go ye unto Hammon, the great, and go down to God of the Philistines. Be they better than these kingdoms, or their borders greater than your borders? Ye that put far away the evil day, and cause the seed of violence to come near, that lie upon beds of ivory, and stretch themselves upon their couches, and eat the lambs out of the flock, and calves out of the midst of the stall, they chant to the sound of the vial, and invent themselves instruments of music like David. They drink wine in bowls, and anoint themselves with chief, chief ornaments. But they are not grieved for the affliction of Joseph. Therefore, now shall they go captive with the first that go captive. And the banquet of them that stretch themselves shall be removed. The Lord God hath sworn by himself, saith the Lord God of hosts, I abhor the excellency of Jacob and hate his palaces. Therefore, I will deliver up the city with all that is therein. Their luxury prompted themselves to, as it says, put off the day of doom. And they put off this day of doom in their minds. They did not want to think about the future. And there's a man, if y'all remember, named Felix in the New Testament, Acts chapter 24, verse 25, who did a similar thing. As he was reasoning to and was told the scriptures, it says, And as he reasoned of righteousness, temperance, and judgment to come, Felix trembled and answered, Go thy way for this time, when I have a convenient season. I will call for thee. God had warned Israel that it might cause some to forget God. In Deuteronomy chapter 8, verses 11 through 14, and verse 17 reads, Beware that thou forget not the Lord thy God, in not keeping his commandments, and his judgments, and his statutes, which I command thee this day. Lest when thou hast eaten and art full, and has built godly, goodly houses, and dwell therein. And when thy herds and thy flocks multiply, and thy silver and thy gold is multiplied, and all that thy house is multiplied, then thy heart be lifted up, and thou forget the Lord thy God, which brought thee into the land of Egypt, and the house of bondage. 
In verse 17 reads, And they say in thine heart, My power and the might of thy hand hath gotten me this wealth. Y'all remember back in the New Testament, the rich man said the same thing? He said, I will build houses, I'll tear down my barn and build greater. And God said, Thou fool, thy soul shall be acquired this night. They weren't keeping God in their plans because they had all this wealth. They said they didn't need God in their own minds. In his earthly ministry, Jesus warned of riches to choke out those who receive the word, uh, the word of God. In the parable of the souls, the, the soils, in Luke chapter 8. And Luke chapter 8, verse 14 reads, And that which fell upon thorns are they, which, when they had heard, go forth, and are choked out with the cares and riches and pleasures of his life, and bring no fruit to perfection. Today, many are in their search for wealth, forgetting about God. Others have filled their time enjoying their luxuries. They have no time for the word of God. Moral corruption is another reason for our present day famine. 2 Timothy chapter 3, starting in verse 1, reads, This know also that in the last day perilous times shall come, for men shall be lovers of themselves, covetousness, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedience to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof, from such turn away. For of this sort are they which creep into houses and lead captive silly women laden with sin, lead away with divers lusts, ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of truth. Now as Janus and Jambres withstood Moses, so do these also resist the truth. Men of corrupt mind, reprobates, concerning faith. You look out in the world around us, and that pretty much describes the world we live in. No one has time for God, but they will spend time doing all this corrupt and moral wickedness. Consider how corrupt people have become in the day of Amos. In Amos chapter 2, verses 6 and 7 reads, Thus saith the Lord, for three transgressions of Israel, and for four, I will not turn away the punishment thereof. Because they sold the righteousness for silver, and the poor for a pair of shoes. They pant after the dust of the earth on the head of the poor, and turn aside the way of the meat. And a man and his father will go in unto the same maid to profane my holy name. Who can deny the immorality is having effect in, on the church today? The world standards have often become the standards of the church because people don't know what is in the Bible. They take what everyone else is doing and say, this is what's good and this is what we should do. When this happens, people will not want to feed upon the word of God because they're enjoying their sins. So why would they want to change and do something they, that takes them away from that? Why is this the cease though? If they did, it would make them very uncomfortable. Because it is the word's ability to reveal our true selves. Hebrews 4, verses 12 through 13. Religious corruption is also a reason for today's famine of the word. The people of Israel could not wait for religious days to be over. Amos chapter 8, verses 4 through verse 10 reads, Hear this, O ye that swallow up the needy, even to make the poor of the land to fail, saying, When will the new moon be gone, that we may sell the corn, and the Sabbath, that we may set forth wheat, making an ephah small, and the shekel great, and falsifying the balances by deceit, that we may buy for the poor for silver, and the needy for a pair of shoes, yea, and sell the refuse of the wheat, the Lord has sworn by the excellency of Jacob, Surely I will never forget any of, our, of their works. Shall not the land tremble for this, and every one mourn that dwelleth therein? And it shall rise up, holy as a flood, and it shall be cast, down, cast out and drowned as by the flood of Egypt. And it shall come to pass in that day, saith the Lord God, 
and I will cause the sun to go down at noon, and I will darken the earth in the clear day. And I will turn your feasts into mourning, and all your songs into lamentation. I will bring up sackcloth upon all loins, and baldness upon every head. And I will make it as the morning of only of only sun, and the end thereof as a bitter day. Too many people can't wait for worship assemblies to conclude so they can go work or play. If they are unwilling to spend time in sincere worship and other works of the church, it is easy to see why they will not take time to feed daily on God's word. Our present day famine of the word of God also produces similar results as it did in Israel. Amos describes a sad picture in Amos chapter 8, verses 13 and 14. It says, In that day shall the fair virgins and the young men faint for thirst. And they swear by the sin of Samaria, and they say, Thy God, O Dan, liveth, and the manner of Beersheba liveth. Again, they shall fall and never rise up again. Young people fainting from thirst. Others failing not to rise again. Doesn't this describe the lives of many Christians today? Suffering from a lack of spiritual food, they are easily overcome by temptations. Even the common trials of life overwhelm them. This may under, help us understand why some new Christians fall away. Young people also uh, often lose interest. The less than faithful conduct uh, of some, the less than faithful conduct of some elders, preachers, and teachers is what it is. There are two things that are necessary to resist the trials of temptation: faith in God. First Corinthians ten and verse thirteen reads, "There hath no temptation taken you that is common to man, but God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that which you are able." But will with the temptation also make a way escape that ye may be able to bear it. Believing that he will provide a way of escape and having that faith in God. But also, we need a fear of God. That awesome reverence that motivates us to turn from evil. Proverbs 16, 6 reads, By the mercy and truth, iniquity is purged. And by the fear of, uh, the, fear of the Lord, men depart from evil. The Word of God is designed to impart both fear and faith. Romans 10, 17 says, So then faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. The condition of many churches today is one of spiritual malnutrition. It's influenced by materialism, immorality, and a lack of true spirituality. By choice have they imposed a famine upon themselves for the Word of God. This helps to explain the discouragement and defeat in the lives of so many Christians today. What can be done about it? How can we end this self-imposed famine for the Word of God? Well, first, we must appreciate the power of God's Word. God's Word possesses the power of creation. We see this all the way back to the beginning of time. When God created the, the world, He did it by the power of His voice. He spoke things into existence. In Hebrews 11, chapter, chapter 11, verse 3, it says, Through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. It has similar power in the spiritual realm, producing true regeneration. John 6, verse 63, and 1 Peter 1, verse 23. It, it possesses the power of sanctification. As praised by David in his psalm, in Psalms chapter 19, verses 11 through, or verses 7 through 11 says, The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making the wise simple. The status of the Lord, the statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eye. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgment of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired than gold 
yea, much fine gold, sweeter also than honey and the honeycomb. Moreover, by them is a servant wanted, a servant warned, and in keeping of them there is great reward. Also mentioned by Jesus in his prayer, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is true, John 17, 17. But God's word also possesses the power of preservation. The young are instructed to keep their ways pure by it. Psalms 119.9 Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed thereto according to thy word. The elders are exhorted to keep the church pure by it. Acts 20 verses 28-32 A lack of knowledge has always destroyed God's people. Hosea tells us this about the people in his day in Hosea 4, 6, and he says, My people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. God's words also possesses the power of salvation and condemnation. It can save our souls when properly received, James 1, 21. And it will be the standard that every single person living or have lived or will live will be judged by. John 12, verse 48. Should this not motivate us to learn the Word of God? Would it not be foolish to neglect such power in our lives? But then we must feed upon it. Like newborn babes longing for their mother's milk, so we need to long for the Word of God. 1 Peter 2 and verse 2. Nothing less than daily reading of God's Word is necessary. We appreciate the value of daily nourishment for our bodies. I know I do. I love food. <laughs> Do our souls deserve any less? They were created in the image of God. They were redeemed and bought by the blood of the Lamb. We know our soul is more valuable than the whole world put together. Matthew 6, verse 20, or verse, sorry, Matthew 16, verse 26. A simple practice of daily Bible reading will go a long way to ending this famine, famine of the Word of God. And it's a habit you have to put yourself in. And no one's saying it's easy. If you haven't started it, it can be difficult. But it's something we have to remind ourselves every day. I'm sure we all spend time on our phones when we could spend 10, 15, 20 minutes with the Word of God. But you have to set aside. And I don't think any of us are excused from that. It's sometimes difficult to make time. A reasonable goal at first, read a chapter a day. At the rate of one chapter a day, one can easily read the New Testament within a year. Once the habit of daily Bible reading has been established, read three chapters a day. This will enable one to read the entire Bible once a year. It takes an average reader only about 10 or about 20 or 30 minutes a day. The use of some Bible reading charts or checklists may be helpful. You can go online and Google reading the whole Bible in a year and you will find charts. That will tell you exactly what verses, what chapters you need to read to do it a year. As you read, make time for meditation and prayer. It's not just enough to read it and you gotta go to sleep, but oh, I haven't read God's word, let me read it. In the beginning, God created the heavens and earth. Okay, I'm done for the night. You have to meditate on the word and understand what God is trying to say to us. Psalms 1, 1 through 3. Praying for wisdom and to uh, help obey God's word. Psalms 119 and verse 18. So in conclusion, it must have been terrible for the Israelites, taken away as captives to a strange land, unable to feed on the wonderful word of God. But how tragic for those who impose a famine of the word of God upon themselves. They have the Bible, they have the ability, they have every means, they have time, but they choose not to read it. They choose not to obey God's word. And what a sad time it will when they stand before God in judgment with no excuse. Sorry, I just didn't do it. By their own neglect, they remain captive to their sins. By their own language, languish from spiritual malnutrition. Their tragedy is increased. When will we realize their neglect is not just one related to the Word of God as it existed in ancient day? 
but they are neglecting the full and final revelation of God's word given through Jesus and his apostles. By God's grace, have so much more to enjoy, yet they turn aside from their spiritual feast. Acts 20 and verse 32. And now, brethren, I command you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you inheritance among all them which are sanctified. Thank you for your time.